Welcome back to Historical. I'm your host, Bradbury Stromworth. Jesus <coughs> fucking Christ. Apologies about that. <coughs> well, welcome, welcome back. Apologies about that. I'm trying to cut back on smoking. Filthy habit causes heart disease, emphysema, all kinds of cancers, and tuberculosis. Is that a hint of today's lesson? Could be. I've been puffing on this new electronic cigarette. It's the personal electronic nicotine inhalation system, which brings me to the subject at hand today. Ooh. Syphilis. <coughs> <coughs> sure, everyone had tuberculosis back in antiquity, but everyone who was anyone had syphilis because it meant you touched at least one titty and weren't a smelly virgin. General Washington, the British are breaking through our ranks. We need to... Say, is that a cephalic postule, I say? I'll never tell. Syphilis cive morbus gallicus, Latin for syphilis, or the French disease, no surprise there, was first recorded in Europe in the mid-1490s, which coincided with Columbus's first voyage, which led many to believe it had come back from the New World. And although unsubstantiated, I would like to believe it's true, seeing as we get blamed for all the other diseases in that exchange. The disease itself presents as a skin rash all over the body, large gaping pustules, ulcerations on the mouth, tongue, teeth and gums, as well as, of course, sores on the pingus and virgingo, respectively. See, look, she's frowning. It would also develop and affect the infected's mind, causing dementia and even psychosis, an affliction that was known as general paralysis of the insane. And since this was a disorder that affected everyone indiscriminately, there was a whole host of crazy cures and treatments. One being as late as 1917, where one Julius Wagner Jorig discovered pyrotherapy actually worked, as he intentionally infected patients with malaria, a practice I'm sure started out as a harmless prank. And in 1927, he even got the Nobel Prize. Well done, fella. Good for you. In 1530, an epic poem by one Girolamo Fracastoro outlined the process of which one ridded oneself of the filly. With these ingredients mixed, you must not fear your suffering limbs and body to besmear, nor let the foulness of the coarse displease, obscene indeed, but less than the disease, the mass of humors now dissolved within, to purge thyself of spittle shall begin, till you with wonder at your feet shall see, a tide of filth, and bless the remedy. Isn't that fun? Gone are the days when you got your medicine with a nice poem. Where is it? Where do they put it? Where? Where is it? Ah! Imodium Plus. Last night out went that to a party. Today awake, all gross and farty. Yes, that's the one. For gone those acts, what of a fool. For now thy sit, struck loose of stool. Oh, yeah, that's happening. If suffer thou, of watery poo, behold ye now what which to do. Imodium plus, a panacea true, no longer will diarrhea you. Nice. Hello, do you need any help, sir? Ah! A night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. A phrase echoed through the centuries, highlighting the dangers and consequences of catching syphilis, and also tacitly blaming women for everything. Bully! The main treatment for much of its prevalence was ingesting mercury, as mercury caused you to salivate excessively, which is thought to have balanced the humors. You see, the body is comprised of four substances, yellow bile, black bile, blood, and phlegm. We're like a big gross daiquiri. When there's a malady within us, it usually means that the humors are out of balance, and we must purge ourselves of one or more of the others to return us back to good health. Although according to recent studies, apparently that is no longer true. But I must remind everyone not to believe everything they hear on the internet. Let me now share with you a list of my favorite people from history who had syphilis. Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard. Guess he should have used protection while raping and pillaging. Well, as the saying goes, learning is a treasure that will follow its owner everywhere. Perhaps that was the treasure he was after all along. Friedrich Nietzsche, big mustache and all-round silly Billy. 
Famously, he said, whatever doesn't kill you only makes us stronger. How did that work out for you, Freddy, you dickhead? <laughs> Ludwig von Beethoven. According to record, his last words were, friends applaud, the comedy is finished. But I'd like to imagine it was, ow, my syphilis hurts. Oscar Wilde. I guess he was waiting for that good dick. That was Samuel Beckett. Hmm? Waiting for Godot was a Beckett play. Oh, well, uh, then, uh, hmm. It feels like the moments passed. Yeah. Oh, looks like he knew the importance of eating spam. Est. Please continue, though. Can I get a drum roll? Sure thing, babe. Lastly, love him or hate him, putting the lad into Adolf, if you mix the letters around, it's your boy, Adolf Hitler. His affliction leaves me to speculate, did he get it from Ava, or... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but for real, that Hitler guy, not a good dude. Like, I'm not going to get into it. At the beginning of the 20th century, the stigma of venereal diseases in the medical community became less stigmatastic, and the discreet practice of treatment became mainstream. A doctor might advise a young man to go on the mercury treatment, and without telling her why, wait for up to four years to sleep with his wife, which I'm sure turned into this hilarious comedy of errors, with her chasing him through various doors in the house like a chase scene from Scooby-Doo. Sounds exhausting. Goodbye!